entire life living in a landlocked state. I also happen to love sharks. And not just, oh, they're my favorite animal type of thing. No, I love everything about them. This came about through the incredible opportunities I've had as an undergraduate student of biology here at Colorado State University and through the School for Field Studies where I assisted Dr. Aaron Henderson in his research on sharks. Seeing how cute a baby shark is reaffirms my belief that all things baby are adorable <laughs> <laughs> and also fostered in me a view that sharks are not these creepy monsters under the waves, but are complex, important animals like all other organisms. I was originally terrified of sharks. In fact, the idea of deep water and big fish even terrified me. I'm not really sure why I thought spending a semester on an island was a good idea. I'm not even a good swimmer. Thankfully, through lots of practice, I was quickly able to overcome my swimming deficiencies, but it took a wholehearted embrace of one of my favorite quotes to overcome my fears. It is, replace fear of the unknown with curiosity. As I began learning how cool sharks are, my curiosity got the best of me, and I was hooked. Sharks actually have a highest stylic jaw, which means their jaw is not connected to the rest of their body by any joint, so they can throw it out farther than they would otherwise be able to. When you see those pictures of sharks and it looks like it's just all teeth, that's because they're literally throwing their jaw out of their face. <laughs> they also have electric electroreceptors all around their nose, so they can sense the electric fields made by the movements of fish. They're the coolest. The way we study sharks is very exciting. This is my most excited expression <laughs> and perfectly describes how I was feeling in this moment. We do not kill any of our sharks for research, and all the sharks that you see that are out of the water are only out long enough that we can measure them, weigh them, take a tiny sliver of skin off the tip of one of their fins as a tissue sample, and tag them beneath the skin with a tiny microchip that's actually the same type of chip used by veterinarians and humane societies here in the United States to tag dogs. We then walk them through the water so that they can kind of reorient themselves and we let them go. When I first began helping out with this research, we were using gill nets, which is clear netting set up vertically in very shallow water that the baby sharks will swim into and get tangled in. At times when the tide is coming in, the water will be up to my chin at the end of the net, which is 100 yards out into the ocean. But walking out 100 yards in water up to my chin in the middle of the night and a flashlight over my head shining for the eyes of sharks was never as terrifying as I thought it was going to be. And I know it sounds terrifying. <laughs> <laughs> but there was always just a scared, helpless baby caught in the net. More recently, we began using underwater baited cameras, and we got some really exciting footage. This is one of my all-time favorite clips, and the bar that you see in the front there is about three feet long. So this is a really big shark. <laughs> <laughs> we also began using long lines, which are basically baited hooks set out in deeper water to catch much larger sharks, and we use circle hooks that are barbless, so that sharks don't swallow them and that they're really easy to remove so we are not hurting sharks in this way. This is a footage, piece of footage of the hammerhead shark that I showed me with originally as we're tagging it. And we caught this guy back in August last year. It was 10 feet long and I cried when I saw it. It was the most awesome, breathtaking experience I've ever had with a wild animal. And this is coming from a Colorado girl with wildlife literally living in my front yard. The more I came into contact with sharks, the more I began to realize that they're just marine wildlife, like bears in Colorado. As we enter their habitat, of course there's risk. It's how living with wildlife works. But they're important, so it's important that we respect them for what they are. So what are sharks? They're a top predator with a life cycle. And in the case of lemon sharks, their life cycle begins when females come into very shallow water in the spring to give live birth to around 10 pups. This little guy is about three months old, so they're really little when they're born. And they'll stay in this shallow mangrove habitat for up to the first three years of their lives, at which point they can be about this big. And this guy's about three feet long. 
Mangroves are trees that grow in the tidal zones along coastal areas, and they provide habitat not only for sharks, but also numerous fish species and birds, and they're really important for protecting coastlines from erosion as well. Sharks are also a top predator, as shown by this very persistent nurse shark who's attempting to tear apart one of our bait cages. The fact that they're a top predator means that they're impacting more than just the populations that they're eating, because those populations affect other things down the food chain. As an example to illustrate what I'm talking about, I'm going to use wolves as the example. In Yellowstone National Park, when wolves were hunted to extinction, the entire ecosystem changed because these elk herds got huge because they didn't face pressure from their top predator and they moved really slowly through tree and shrub stands, which just decimated them. They weren't running as much, so the soil didn't get aerated, and everything in Yellowstone changed. We can see this type of change occurring again since wolves have been reintroduced, and even the courses of rivers are changing. Like wolves, we know that sharks are a top predator, so they're having really big impacts on their entire marine ecosystems. Sharks eat fish, and fish populations dictate what coral and algae and seaweed populations look like. Even though we don't know the exact dynamics of how all this works, we know that sharks are really important in keeping all of this functioning. And the oceans are really important to us because they drive our climate and our weather, and they are also really important for the global economy through fishing and biotechnologies and tourism. One reason that we need to study sharks is to be able to know how to best protect them so that we can continue to balance this need to continue using our marine resources. One really cool thing that we're finding out from our research of studying babies is that we believe female sharks are coming back to the same mangroves year after year to give birth, and this has huge conservation implications. If we don't know where to best protect sharks, how are we going to protect them? All of this is a problem of today, not tomorrow, because sharks are disappearing at an alarming rate. Direct threats that I won't go into much detail today because they've been really well publicized include finning and culling. Finning refers to when the dorsal fin is cut off of a shark and the rest of the shark thrown away, at which point it's dead. Culling refers to the widespread killing of sharks along popular beaches as an attempt to curb shark attacks, which is actually wildly ineffective because the oceans are a huge place and sharks are highly mobile creatures. So it would be much more effective to understand why shark attacks are happening and in what circumstances and try to address those problems instead. The big threat that I want to emphasize today is actually habitat loss. And you might think, well, they have the whole ocean, but they actually don't. We know that they're using mangrove habitat for a really important and vulnerable part of their lives. And mangroves only grow in tropical climates, along coastlines, and 35% of all the world's mangroves have disappeared in the past decade because of coastal development and human impacts. This is a rate, according to the Smithsonian, that is higher than the rate of destruction of tropical rainforest. Mangroves are like the world's forgotten rainforest. They're an entire ecosystem that's both marine and terrestrial, and is home to some of the world's most important species. This theory that mama sharks come back to the same mangroves year after year makes this threat especially concerning, because we don't know what would happen if a mama shark's mangrove is destroyed. It could be hypothesized that her pups wouldn't survive without sufficient habitat, and she might never reproduce successfully again. So what can you do from a landlocked state? What am I doing from a landlocked state? A lot of it actually has to do with lifestyle. Another big threat to sharks is actually being caught as bycatch. For example, in Finding Nemo, when Dory is caught in the net, she is bycatch. She has unintendedly caught marine life. Um, along with all the other fish that fishermen are trying to catch. Um, luckily for Dory, she escapes, unlike the numerous sharks and fish and rays and turtles that don't on a daily basis. A big thing that you can do to help curb this effect is only eating and buying sustainably harvested seafood. There are apps you can get on your phone that outline exactly the best and the worst seafood you can buy based on how it's caught. 
For example, fishermen who use metallic repulsion devices or circle hooks on the end of their long line are less likely to catch and kill sharks and lots of other marine life. You could also make a switch to eat more th things like tilapia, which is sustainably farmed fish, or eat more things like clams and oysters that don't create bycatch at all. Another great thing you can do is to do some research before you travel to coastal destinations and consider staying someplace that did not replace a mangrove habitat. I know this can be really hard to discern from the information presented to you as consumers, so start by looking into places that pride themselves on being environmentally friendly and are perhaps not right on the water, because chances are lower that these places replace a mangrove. Shrimp farming is another really big destroyer of mangroves because the shrimp ponds have to be right in the tidal zone, which is also where mangroves grow. So mangrove forests are commonly clear-cut and replaced with shrimp ponds. So I no longer eat shrimp, and I love shrimp, <laughs> but I love sharks more. And I believe in the theory that demand feeds supply and that we should be really conscious of how we're spending our money and our time and how it's impacting the future of our world, especially our oceans. A live shark is worth so much more than a dead one. So if you feel so inclined, go support a business that's making itself based on the ethical existence of sharks. Go dive or snorkel with one, see one in an aquarium, Learn more about one. Just let your curiosity drive you as it did for me, and I promise that you will be captivated. Then do something so that your lifestyle reflects your respect for the very beautiful and important wildlife that sharks are. Thank you.